Hi everyone and welcome to Fair Trade Philadelphia's annual Fashion Revolution event. I'm looking at you there. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so we're so excited to be here in person and offer this program in a hybrid format so you can participate and engage in the conversation both physically here and digitally. We have almost 90 people registered today for our event digitally. That just really shows to, um, speaks volumes about the readiness of our community to make a difference when it comes to our fashion choices. For those of you who are new here, we're Fair Trade Philadelphia. My name is Gurpreet Talwar and I'm a part of uh, the steering committee here. We at Fair Trade Philadelphia, our mission is to cultivate and scale a more fair, equitable, honest economy throughout Philadelphia by educating and uniting consumers, enterprises, and institutions around fair trade principles. Our agenda today is to kick off with the event with a short video to introduce fashion revolution and why this movement is important. And you'll also see glimpses of our mission-led businesses on our panel here today. We have uh, 30 minutes for our panel and about 10 to 15 minutes for our audience to ask questions later. So um, digital folks, hang in there, ask questions. And uh, we'll also be calling out nine raffle winners uh, for, so you gotta stay here and let us know when you're, if your name is called so we can quickly coordinate how to get those $50 to shop at their businesses to you. Uh, so I'm gonna quickly introduce the panel out uh, we have Dr. Kimberly McClung, the founder of Grand Boulevard. Kimberly is an advocate for justice and environmentalism. This informs her approach to leadership in the fashion industry. As a founder and CEO of a manufacturing startup and B Corp, uh, she oversees the creative direction and growth strategy of the brand. Next, we have Lindsay True. She is Fab Scraps regional manager and runs their Philadelphia location. Lindsay joined the Fab Scraps, Fab Scraps team in 2019 after witnessing firsthand the waste being created by the fashion industry while working in styling and merchandising and is passionate about keeping textiles outside of landfills and inspiring creative reuse. And our third panelist is Mel Melanie Hassan, the founder of Modest Transitions. Melanie aims to empower women through conscious garments, beauty, and inclusion, while, of course, re respecting Mother Earth. From sourcing fabrics with integrity cr to creating baths of natural dyes, Modest Transitions products help eliminate toxic waste while creating timeless, aesthetically pleasing, wearable art. So you can see back there we have pieces from each of these brands. Um, and of course, please check out their websites. Um, our panel is moderated by Elizabeth Quinn. You'll see her soon. Uh, Elizabeth is a Philadelphia-based designer um, with over 15 years of corporate experience uh, as both a merchant and a designer. Elizabeth has been teaching environmental and social sustainability in fashion design since 2018, having spent both time here at Drexel University and the University of Delaware, Elizabeth will start a tenure track at Albright University, Albright College in fall 2022. Congratulations. So, um, all right, I'm gonna let, after, after we see the video, Elizabeth will lead us into dialogue and uh, let's kick off the video and get this event started. Thank you.
Jessica Schreiber. I'm the founder and CEO of Fab Scrap. We're a nonprofit that works with the fashion industry to collect excess and unwanted materials and recycle or redistribute them so that they can be upcycled and reused. Um, I started Fab Scrap because I was hearing from fashion companies that there was this waste stream that both made them sad and didn't have a good solution. And so Fab Scrap works as a thrift store for raw materials. I think we're all really familiar with thrift stores that deal in used goods, but not so much for the raw materials that can still be utilized and made and we can extend the life of those fabrics. And so that's what Fab Scrap is hoping to address. printed with real willow eucalyptus leaves. So our mission here at Modern Transitions is to make sustainable women's apparel. Mm -hmm. um, being a Muslim woman, sometimes um, I like to show my personality, it's bold, it's fun. So I like to say this is my way of always being invited to the party. So I'm showing up in an imprinted eucalyptus dress. Um, so all the materials and things that are in the shop are either reclaimed or reused from my own production line. Uh, what you see here, everything on this wall was completely hand dyed and naturally hand dyed by materials that you see on the wall or what we're currently growing in our dyer's garden that's under construction right now. So values of Grand Boulevard include uh, making an ethical, ethical decisions when it comes to fashion, wearing our values, um, including like in mass incarceration and ending cash bail in Philadelphia, and also being a company that uh, has a green impact. Thank you for that video the fair trade um, team put together I think that was really great before we get started with our conversation with our panelists here we're so excited for you guys to all be here I did want to just quickly re-welcome those who are joining us virtually um, we have a small group of people here live um, and a very large group of people virtually so thank you all for being here with us in person and virtually for those of you that we can't see physically in front of us right now, um, I've been told that you've been starting to chat and say where you're from. If you haven't already introduced yourself, please make sure to do so. And then Guru and Iris are gonna sort of do some shout outs later um, in the program here tonight. So as we get started, we heard from Guru a little bit about your businesses. Um, you know, she did a great introduction. 
and we saw a little bit about you know your businesses here on the screen but could you guys just quickly introduce yourselves tell us a little bit about you um, and what your role is and your mission is and you know what what you're doing with the businesses that you work with okay I can start um, my name is Lindsay I'm from fab scrap we are a textile recycling nonprofit and um, we just opened our second location here in Philadelphia in November of last year um, originally we have a location in Brooklyn as well we've been operating for about five years and we work directly with the fashion industry as well as the interior design industry to to keep textile waste out of landfill um, and little over five years we've been operating now and in March we hit our millionth pound saved from landfill so we're very excited about that um, we're very excited to be in Philly working with brands like Grand Boulevard and Modest Transitions and just um, kind of keeping the sustainable fashion community going my name is Melanie Hassan I am the founder and natural dyer of Modest Transitions. We just opened our brick and mortar um, in Fishtown, and I'm super excited to say that we're the first black owned natural dye studio here in the city. My job at Modest Transitions is to create wearable art that inspires women to have a more holistic approach to textiles. So at the studio, you'll see that we have um, a natural dye garden where we provide education tools as well as create inspiration to love nature. Um, more. <laughs> Can you guys hear okay? Are we? Is our sound okay for at home? Okay, great. Um, hey, everybody. Thanks, first of all, for that video. That video was so well produced, so thanks for that, whoever was behind the scenes pulling that magic off. Um, I'm Kimberly McLaughlin. I'm the founder of Grant Boulevard. I founded the company in 2017. It was really in response to a growing awareness about the criminal system and about the ways in which our criminal system create these persistent kind of economic barriers to self-sufficiency, particularly for black folk, particularly for brown folk, particularly for women, particularly for mothers. Um, so as I, I kind of understood more and more the the pain points of, of that and how it interacted with just the story of my life, I decided I wanted to figure out a pathway to create jobs. And I thought that maybe fashion could be the lane. I studied the industry like so many of you are doing right now and discovered um, how horrible it is on the planet and how cruel it is to humans and decided that I wanted to experiment with building something that worked differently. So that's what Grant Boulevard aspires to do is to design fashion in a way that um, doesn't create more harm and in fact actually creates pathways for hopefully some real meaningful healing. Um, and so that's the story of us. So our brick and mortar is on 36 in Lancaster, so super close to campus if you're ever you know, meandering over that way. Um, we'd love to see you in person. And our studio is not not too, too far. It's in Philadelphia as well. It's in the Crane Arts Building, which is in the Northern Liberty section of the city. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. And we are really excited. I'm going to slide up because I feel like I'm on a weird plane with you guys. <laughs> All right. So we're here tonight, middle of April. We're here this week specifically because over the last decade, um, this week in April has become known as Fashion Revolution Week. Um, Fashion Revolution Organization kind of was founded in the wake of the Rana Plaza factory collapse in Bangladesh on April 24th, uh, 2013. And every year since then, they've sort of, they've honored this, this week, they've honored this tragedy with, um, you know, highlighting and bringing to light the atrocities that are throughout the supply chain in the fashion industry, and really highlighting how as consumers, we can make an impact with our, with our wallets, with our purchasing choices, and also bringing to light for the industry how we need to make an impact, a positive impact and change and disrupt the traditions of the industry. So with that in mind, I'm curious from each of your perspectives, you know, what, how, how do you think it's going? <laughs> how do you think, you know, we have come in the nearly the past decade in terms of fashion activism and what does fashion revolution mean to each of you and your businesses at this point in time? Those are big questions. I know they are. <laughs> those are those are big questions. We have amazing yeah, people yeah. Who can answer these big yeah, questions. Yeah, no, here I'm here for it. Um I think that I mean I think that the fact that more of us are gathering in these conversational spaces is is a shift. I think that 
one of the things that's even happened in the last four years are these spaces are more inclusive than I think that they they were when I first started five years ago. Um, I remember being, you know, the only woman of color five years ago. And, and the fact that there's some there's some disruption in that way, I think, makes for a healthier conversation. I think it allows for some pathways for some honesty and some innovation and some some tenderness, which is such a big part of what I hope is going to continue to emerge moving forward. So I think that's happening. I think that there's more consumer awareness about the need to think about climate change differently. Um, and I think one thing that comes with that is greenwashing, is greenwashing, right? So, so you know, it's like we are, we're, we're moving in, in this wave and we have to continue to try to stay out in front of that wave and continue to try to push back against um, larger budgets that try to, you know, produce narratives that are simply not true. Um, and I think that that's what the revolution means to me. You know, revolution to me, continue to use that word disruption. It's one of my, my favorite words. I think revolution means continuing to disrupt. I, I also think of the women who I've, I've always admired most who were deemed radical by, by you know, societies, you know, governments that really sought to silence them. And, and women who were radical always sought to pull things out from the root. So when I think about what happens moving forward, I think we have to continue to weed the garden of the industry and to figure out how we're going to take out of it practices that are polluting um, in all the ways, polluting, you know, in terms of like what they what they leave in communities and what they take from communities. So. Um, yeah, I think Fab Scrap being not a producer of clothing, but instead a resource for designers to responsibly deal with their waste or responsibly source materials to create. Um, the kind of activism that we've really seen grow and that we're kind of a big part in is um, kind of ethical consumption, but also um, sustainably sourcing. Um, and we've seen a real growth predominantly with students. Um, that is a big part of our community uh, when we talk to colleges and schools. Now it feels like people who are going into design and going into the fashion industry are are starting out with this awareness and a knowledge um, that's really impressive. And I think it's really gonna shape careers going forward. So there's a lot of optimism about like where the industry can go. Um, and as far as like Fab Scrap kind of experiences, we see that like the people who are introducing Fab Scrap and are, who are thinking about the waste that their companies are creating are not often coming from like the top down, it's often coming from the bottom up. And it's one person who's in a design studio who's saying like, why are you throwing that away? Or like, why do we order so much of this? Why do we produce so much waste? Like, what are we doing? Um, and a lot of that is coming like from students and younger people and who are really being kind of brought up in participating in conversations like this and having um, classes in school on this these subjects. So, I also think education is very important. I know a couple of years ago, I was not as sustainable. So I think that plays a really big role in revolution. Um, one thing that I'm currently frustrated with, with these large um, businesses, is that how many times we've been in um, retailers such as Target and things like that. They now have things that are mimicking um, very simple tools that we can do to mend our clothes. Um, patchwork, uh, we have seen granny squares, and it's really created a sense of frustration with me because I am on the smaller level where I'm trying to work with our community to teach these tools of how you could source and become more sustainable using agriculture and just using what you had to create capsule collections. So it's really frustrating to me that now it's almost like we're losing a sense of our education where we're taught these tools to how to mend, how to do patchwork, how to quilt with reclaimed materials or like our old baby clothes and things of that nature. And then we're competing with big box retailers where they're now mass producing granny squares and things that mimic knit and crochet. Um, so I think education is very important with where do you stand at? Um, we have a lot of students as well that's coming to the our textile studio, which I absolutely love because the number one question that we're asked all the time is based off of fiber with how can they learn how to weave, um, wove their own materials and how can they now work up that supply chain, which is kind of where I am now going back and shifting to in regards to this circular movement. So I love that we do have a lot more students that are coming in that are being more conscious about how can we make a change versus let's go to the top. Um, you know, to those larger retail or designers. 
think you, you all bring up, this is off script a little bit, but I think you guys all bring up good points about, you know, there's, there's a lot more access to information. And I think younger, the younger generations who have access to social media and have access to a lot more of this than we all did five years ago, you know, 10 years ago when we, you know, sort of were coming up in this industry. Um, and I think to your point, Melanie, about these big box brands who are sort of mimicking and doing that greenwashing mm -hmm. of, you know, this is what it looks like, but it's it's truly just being mass produced, um, you know, throughout a supply chain that is still broken. I, I think they're gonna see through it. I mean, I'm, I'm glass half full about it. I think that, you know, the, the people who are actually making those purchases are asking the questions. And so I'm hopeful that they're, they're gonna see through that and it's not gonna last, but, you know, yeah, go ahead. It might be, it might come up later, but I think the one thing that really frustrates me is like when we talk about ethical labor and fair labor, we actually have people here um, in other countries, here in the States, here in the city, locally where they crochet, knit, weave as a full-time job. So now that we have these large bid by stores doing these things at mass production levels, it now takes away the integrity and authenticity of someone like me who actually knits by hand, who dies by hand. So now if we're at a market or an artisan or some type of gallery, um, what happens? We may have our item on display for what, 250, 360. I have seen some as high as a thousand dollars. Well, now it goes into the consumer. If, okay, well, this looks very similar at this location. So I'm going to buy it here because it's 20 when someone like myself probably spun the yarn, dyed the yarn, right? And then went and turned it into a really gorgeous piece. Um, and there's a lot of intention, but that's why like, I'm getting really emotional just thinking about it. Because when I recently seen it come out like a month ago, I just stopped and I was just like, you have to be kidding me. And it's affecting so many makers and artisans right now because of mass production. And makers and artisans who are yes. trying to do the right thing yes. and trying to move forward and trying to educate and trying to put out, you know, yes. the, the right products for the right people. And that actually does bridge into sort of the next topic that I wanted to get into. Um, so every year, Fashion Revolution, you know, has a theme for what this week is going to stand for so that we can sort of bring light to a different topic in this very complex industry that we are all a part of. And so this year's topic is, wait, let me get it right, money, fashion, and power, right? So what you're talking about leads kind of perfectly into this. Um, you know, fashion as an industry has definitely had its moments of being very elitist, right? You know, traditionally, historically, we look at fashion as who can afford luxury, who can afford to stand out from the masses, right? And, and who cannot, and that really sort of creates these segments of people and, you know, and, and, a, and a true hierarchy within the industry and consumers themselves. And so, you know, fashion, fast fashion in itself was a revolution, right? It, it gave a very large consumer base access to trendy clothes, to, you know, what we traditionally would have thought as maybe luxurious, right, fashion forward. Um, while albeit sweeping under the rug the ways in which they were bringing this you know, product so cheaply to the market. But as we sort of you know, transition into a more ethical space, we're being more socially responsible, culturally responsible, environmentally responsible in our practices, especially here with small businesses, where the cost of goods mm -hmm. is very much reflective of living wages and, and people's, you know, handcrafting goods. Are we, you know, one, how do we address that? How do we educate consumers on why there is such a difference between these big box companies and what they're producing that seems so similar and, and versus what we're doing by hand? But then also, how do we figure out how to bridge the gap in the inequality that we're now bringing back into the space of who has access to sustainable fashion versus, you know, who who still has to sort of partake in the big box, um, you know, consumerism? Again, really big question. So, you know, any any one of those that you want to sort of jump in and start with, how do how do we address these ideas of? power and money in the fashion industry and, and you know sort of bridging the gap for consumers and for people along the whole supply, supply chain. <laughs> Do you want to continue? Education. <laughs> Education is key here and I'm speaking from experience. 
Um, I was someone who used to buy the 50 ball yard of fabric and was just cutting and just putting it in. I, I was in this accountability. But education is so important because even I, some, I'm actually getting to a point where I don't even want to use the word sustainability because it is elite. It gives a level of privilege, money, power, and access. Um, where you could come from whatever economical um, background that you're from and education is so important because I could be someone making $24,000 a year. It goes into habits and choices. Um, be, to be sustainable is actually a lifestyle. Where, where do you shop at? How do you recycle your materials? What we do at the shop now, just trying to add to our circular movement is we have now put a challenge up to how many trash bags are we gonna put outside um, and what does our recycling bin look like and how can we reclaim those materials back into packaging or back into our dye work? And you'd be surprised just by changing certain habits, um, you're adding to the entire movement. Um, I have even spoken to people where, well, how do I be sustainable? And I'm like, don't use that. Don't, don't, don't. Because you can't 100% be sustainable. It's always going to be a, broke, a chain broken. So... As long as you have really good habits and you're willing to change your lifestyle, then I think you're making good strides towards the movement of all these issues that we're talking about right now. But it really starts with education with how do we change our lifestyle and what does it look like? So maybe recycle a little bit more. Um, maybe don't wash your clothes every week. If you have a stain, I'm a dyer. So that stain just adds beauty. There has been plenty of times where I took rusted cans and add it to other things that I had. How do we mend projects? Um, there are many things we can do to keep waste out of our landfills. And even how do we treat our agriculture? Do we know how to compost? How much waste did we throw away every day between eggs, avocado pits? You don't even realize that at times we have all the tools that we need in our own homes in order to add to the circular um, movement that we're moving for. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm trying to get back to the, the core of the question. Money, power, fashion. Yeah. Like, how do you define that for your business? Because again, I think, you know, right. Right. there's right. been lots of conversations right. about, right. you know, how, how do you bring access right. to ethical, you're right, I hate to use that word as well, so how do you get around using that word, but, you know, responsible practices and, yeah. and businesses that are doing the right thing, like how do we use the power, yeah. and how do we use the money in fashion for good? Right. Yeah, I, I do think that, you know, when I think about us as a company, we spend about, Grand Boulevard spends about 67% of our revenues on on wages. Like that's a, it's a major investment, right? Companies, all these companies are all, who are thinking about profitability, they're thinking about how are they going to spend that profit? And for us, it's about investing it in our people. And that's, a, I think that's a major, a major pathway to, to building a business that is centering um, equity and centering justice and, and really using money in ways that are, that are fair. Um, I also think about the fact of how can we as a company offer a variety of price points? You know, I think if we were to only center ourselves on the items that are that are more labor intensive, so they're inherently more expensive, and that was the only thing that we offered, we're by default blocking out the people who I grew up with. So for us, it's like, how do we figure out how to offer things at a variety of price points so that there's a variety of participation points? Mm -hmm. And what I hope to see in movements of, of, of ethical consumption, of, of access, of inclusion, is that there's a variety of price points are offered so that everyone has a chance to participate where they are. And that's something that we, you know, at Grand Boulevard, we've been trying to be really intentional about is how do we make make participating and, and living sustainably, as Melanie was talking about, affordable and accessible. And that's that's one mechanism for doing that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think when we talk about accessibility at Fab Scrap, it's kind of getting these materials that were once headed for landfill, but are often totally usable, good quality designer materials that are just being wasted. How do we get those back into the hands of people who need them? And how do we do that at an affordable price? And um, I think anyone who's tried to start a business who works in fashion, like knows the material costs are like grand and you have so many other costs and like, it's such an investment and high price point like industry to get into. And so if we're able to offer materials to young designers and small businesses and do it at a more affordable price point, like that's always Fab Scrap's goal. And 
we try to work with other organizations and students and if you volunteer and we try to give free fabric and there's just um, a lot of ways where we're trying to help but then also those aren't as easy as just walking into a fabric store and ordering exactly what you need for exactly what you had pictured so it's like yes we can make this fabric waste accessible but like then the brand is going to have to um, learn how to produce what are they producing with only 20 yards of material or like oh they really wanted a like a cotton but we only have a cotton blend and like so there's so many different hurdles so it's like you kind of solve one and the, but then you're faced with another so I think it's just understanding as a consumer the value that goes into literally everything the value of the labor that was put into it the value of the materials that they're made from um and it's just that adds up so quickly and it, do, it does get unsustainable mm -hmm. and it does get expensive and it's it's a really hard question to reckon with. And I think about what you just said, Lindsay, about this, these words of, of money and what you talked about with power. And you, you, you talked specifically about values. And if we only shop with the value of, 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 of being of power, right, as using fashion to show power, then that guiding value is a, a really a major part of the cultural failure, failure right? So really it's about a, a reevaluation of our values and then figuring out how are we living our values? How are we wearing our values? How are we shopping our values? And, and I think that that's part of the revolution too, is like, how are we doing that kind of inner work to, to redirect what's happening in our own value system? So I have, well, I'm getting the 10 minute sign just to, to kind of get, put things in perspective. Um, I have one more kind of big question um, to kind of ask to each of you you know, what, what is the next step? Okay. So like, you know, we have a lot of these conversations. We've been having a lot of these conversations for the past decade, right. And, and even longer for many people who are in the industry and have been focused on, you know, this word of sustainability for a long time, but how do we, how do we make action out of this? How do we really look at production and how do we really look at consumerism um, and, and make changes? How do we make actionable actionable changes and again i think from from each of you knowing a bit about your businesses you know you're each sort of taking a different segment of that to push forward and see how you can make change so i'd love to just hear from your perspective you know what is what is your action plan on how you fit into that the the you know the change the um the activism of how we look at the production of goods and how we look at the consumption of goods I really love the idea, you know, I love the idea of what we're working on over at Grand Boulevard, which is how do we, how do we build out a 5,000 square foot space where we can teach women who are formerly incarcerated how to, how to sew? How do we use that to empower them to identify in new ways as creatives, as a way of, of like, you know, just kind of restoring a sense of humanity, which is such a major part of what gets lost in the entire supply chain. You know, we talk about what's happening in fast fashion and that production cycle. So much of it is about dehumanizing people. So I'm really excited to figure out how we as a brand, as a company can contribute in a way to shifting how we are cultivating makers as a way of forming identities and how we're introducing our team of makers to our, our consumer base, to our customers, to our community. So super excited about that in terms of the, the production response. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of the thinking about, you know, what, what our big, my biggest hope is, is as I think, as I go back to like my comment at the top of the conversation was when I joined these, these conversations five years ago, they were not inclusive. And I think when I, when I, when I realize and really sit with the state of the planet in terms of how, how our clock is really speeding up and winding down to make some seismic shifts, we cannot do that unless we get more people on board and rather we deem it sustainable or we deem it, you know, ethical, or we call it, you know, I don't, whatever we're going to, how are we going to do the branding? If the branding doesn't bring everyone into the conversation, then it's a failure. It's, it still becomes a failure. So I'm excited for Grand Boulevard to, you know, we're, we, we're moving in a new direction as a brand. And we're, we're really interested in speaking to a new audience that wants to communicate through their clothes a sense of sensuality and sexuality and self-empowerment and self-possession through their fashion. And I'm excited about doing that and, and making that a part of an inclusive conversation that welcomes different body sizes, different cultural traditions into conversations about, about you know, saving the planet. We're back Ooh. live. Ooh. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you for being on hold. <laughs> Here we back are live. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Where did we leave off? Um, I can, yeah, pick up from Consumption. the next steps. And next yes, steps. exactly. Thank you. Going forward. Um, 
for Fab Shop specifically going forward, I mean, our focus is expansion. Um, we have, like I said, a million pounds collected. That's largely only in New York. Um, we just expanded to Philly. We're starting to collect here. I think we've collected 20,000 pounds in Philly in the six months we've been here. Um, we want to go to diff other cities. We want to go to the West Coast. There's literal literal tons and tons of fabric waste everywhere and we just kind of want to expand to tackle it all and we want to at the same time expand to make these materials accessible um, across the nation there's a lot of places where it's not easy to find fabric and it's not easy to get these materials so we love in the future to be as um, ever present and expanded as we can um, in terms of industry change what I think excites me most is the idea of legislation, I think um, if we're looking at like big seismic changes, that's really where we can make a big difference and where I think there needs to be some like step in from the government. And I think um, the mass production companies need to be held responsible for the damage they're doing. Um, I think they produce and produce and make profit off of it and then don't think about it. They don't think about the waste being created. They don't think about their workers, they don't kind of, are they aren't held responsible for any of that size thing. So I think there's a lot of legislation po possibilities where we can hold those people responsible. And I think there's a lot of legislation opportunities where we could provide benefit and incentive to small businesses who are working responsibly, who are producing locally, um, who are, you know, doing the right work. Um, I think they need support because it's not easy and it's not cheap. And if we want to make that um, the real change going forward, then they require support. And I'm working more from the education portion where I'm actually I'm starting from the land. Um, and I love that this year is power and ownership. Um, I'm actually I'm taking a couple steps away from the sewing machine and designing where I want to understand what it feels like to have your complete assembly line from the land. So growing flats, growing cotton, all of the labor and the work that goes into it, and also providing education with how can we create our own natural dye and textiles within our own backyard. So in Modest Transitions, I'm looking for also expansion in land, but also challenging a lot of the issues that's going on in the city with gentrification and how folks like us in the smaller communities, how we can't have access to land because we have developments coming in and pulling our city away when there's folks like us trying to make a difference. So I am working on the land right now. <laughs> I love it. Wonderful. And these are all great. I'm getting getting the signal. Do we want to move into the Q&A portion? Yeah. Okay. So Guru and Iris, do you guys want to handle if there's questions? I don't know if anyone has questions here. And then maybe Rachel, since you are online, maybe you can help to facilitate if any of our virtual friends have questions and they want to add them to the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. Anybody here want to get us started with any questions? Again, I know we're a small group here, but would love if you have. Yeah, go for it. Sorry, hang on. <laughs> um, okay, so the people that like they message me on social media or whatever, and they're asking like um, just about accessibility because like they're just like, oh, you you want to sell this, but like people our age are not able to afford this. So um, I know we talked it's like a lot about education, but I just am not entirely sure what to say back because like of course it it has to be enough money for like to invest in your brand and everything to keep your own education to make it more like responsible and everything so it's just like a hard question and like a hard answer to give them because I'm like not entirely sure what to say so it's that balance yeah that balance between craft like we've been talking about that balance between craft and also paying living wages right and again I think you you know you, you you've talked about it a little bit but if you have anything to add to like what what is that balance how do you find that balance Kimberly you talked a little bit about how much of yeah. you know what Grant Boulevard brings in goes directly to paying those living wages yeah I think that for to, the question is about you know how do people on a budget how do they how do they figure out how to shop and be do shopping what's on trend and at the same time being conscious of the fact that their resources are tight and I think it comes down to, to a, a, like a, a, a shopping strategy, right? 
So there's a strategy where it's like, I'm going to thrift. Like this is the, for people who are not makers, like if you're a maker, then you can go to Fab Scrab and you can pick up fabric and you can make it yourself. If you want to add something to something you already had, you can go to Modest Transitions and Melanie can help you make that happen. If you're not either of those things and you want something that special, you can do two things, right? You can use, you can, you can thrift it like as a strategy, or you can say my budget for shopping for the month of December is a hundred dollars. I'm going to buy one or two things from Grant Boulevard that I really love because I love that story. And I love walking into a space with a piece that when someone says, where did I get it from? I know who made it and I know how much they were paid to make it. And that is why I invested in that because it aligns with my values. So I think it's like really the deeper dive for people who are figuring out how are they spending their money is not what they're buying, but why are they buying it and who are they buying it from and how are they going to take care of it so that it can last longer, you know, and, and, and how are they building a relationship with the things in their closets? And really, that's about the word that I love, curation. It's about how are you, even when you're 18, 19, 20, 55, 70, how are you possessing things with a real artfulness for being a curator of the things that you spend money on? And I think when we do that, then we end up with pieces that we love because they're not just about a trend. They're about a story of who we are and where we were in a moment. And, and ultimately, right, how cool would it be to pass along something that's a legacy piece? for people who you may not even never, never even meet, but because it tells an extension of a story of who you were when you were alive. So I think it's about like that, that balance of things, right? Um, and, and if you, and there's so many like really dope ethical brands who are thinking about how to design in ways that are, that are very much so on trend, depending on how you're interpreting trend. It's just like intentionality, right? It's like, I'm, I really, I don't want to just date these values of mine. I want to marry them. And I know that's hard when you're 18 to think about that level of commitment. But when it comes to your values, really, it's like, how much do I want my closet to tell, tell a story of who I am? And that's what fashion's always been about, is a story of who we are in a moment. So let our the story of who we are in a moment also reflect our highest values, right? So make different choices. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just add, I think it really is like an evaluation, like yeah. you said, and like really think about it like big picture and it does require some research. Yeah, yeah. Like to find a brand that you identify with and that you know where it's getting made and how it's getting made. And you know what you're going to spend for the month or what you're going to spend for the next two months. But H and M top shop, fast fashion, Zara, she they, they're not, yes, yeah, she in, they're not making millions of dollars because they sold one person, one $5 top. They're making millions of dollars because they sell an individual, Twenty five dollar top. So it's like if you actually do the math of what you're spending and what you're getting out of the product and how long that product will last and how many times you'll wear it, like there is some math there where I think it's um, you just have to put some thought into it. Just say one other thing. You know, I think that those of us who are who grew up in the American story, right? We we went to school and I mean maybe this is changing now with all these conversations about critical race theory. But for a long time, we were taught that slavery happened. Some of us were. And that it was a horrible thing and that it needed to end and it was ended and, and America's better because it ended. And if we want to hold on to that and at the same time shop from brands who are really comfortable with slavery, then we have to also recognize that we are being incredibly, deeply, horribly hypocritical. And that's something that we need to do in terms of examining who we are versus who we think we are. And I think that, that making these shifts is about an examination of who are we, not who do we, who do we think we are. But how do our choices reflect who we are, right? And, and I think that that's, a, that's, for me, that's another part of how we make decisions that we can really find joy and, and pride in. Do you have anything to add? I'm trying to back to something. My brain. These are like... <laughs> <laughs> that was a lot. There was a, there was a lot there. <laughs> there was absolutely a lot there. Um, Billy, I think you had a question. Look at their consumption, and even, you know, I think it's like in a conversation, they might still walk out saying, 
I don't know. I think your shirt is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think your shirt is Y'all can't see Billy, but his shirt is kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's coming up, y'all. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. We have like, we're going to do a little model. A little model. This is, this is reimagined menswear, zero waste, right? Um, ethically produced here in Philadelphia, all the things, super cool. Yes. Yes. So the question was, you know, how do we, when we look at the, the, the difference, like this massive space between the budgets of small companies that are centering, you know, this ethical decision making and these larger brands who, because they're not paying their workers, they have these gross, you know, this, all this gross money to invest in marketing. How do small brands even compete in trying to figure out how to sell what's cool, right? It's a question about how do you sell what's cool when you don't have a marketing? And I get it. Yeah, 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 yeah more or less. How are we, how are we getting to cool? They do. They do. Yeah. Yeah. And there was a statistic that was dropped that they have approximately 30 to 40% what we have. So if, if on average, if my consumer acquisition, you know, spend is like $3, theirs is like 90, right? And so, and, and over the cost of like getting a, a, a customer to really commit, they, they make their money backs in spades. And how do we compete with that? And I think it's a, it's a, it's a strategy of two things, right? I think on one hand, it's like for us, how are we figuring out how to be vocal and be visible, right? We have to spend a lot of time, you know, connecting with people in ways that other brands are not interested in connecting and building community. Um, and I think that part of that is, is like really asking the people who get behind us to share about us and their stories, to come in and shop and take pictures and post when they're there, to buy things and post in them, to be brand ambassadors because they, they align with our values. That's how we survive. And I also think it's, you know, how do we figure out how to continue to tell our stories to larger and larger audiences? And that's, that is definitely just like, that's the, that's the struggle. Um, and I also think on a, back to the, he used, Billy A used the word, how do you do this when it's like so cerebral? Like it's so in your head. How do you get people to make decisions about what's cool when it's so much of it is about thinking? And we have a culture that doesn't necessarily, you know, necessarily encourage deep thinking. I still believe in deep thinking. So it doesn't, you know, like it, it may not be the, the, the thing to do. I still think deep thinking is cool. And I still want to encourage people to think deeply. And I think that we lose the fight to save the planet if we don't get to a point of trying to push for more deep thought. So I'm team deep think. And, and that is just, that's just where I fall on it. I'll go. Um, so to be cool, right? So I actually struggled with that when I first started Modest Transitions because I said, how do I do this as a Muslim woman, right? Because we have to dress differently. And it's very well known, right, with how we have to dress. We have to be a little bit more covered and modest. So I wanted to find a way because I did feel displaced where I'm like, wow, I really want to wear those mom jeans. I want to wear kimonos, but how do I do so? But nine times out of 10, what I hear is why do we as Muslim women have to wear black? And I wanted to find a way to eliminate that. I have did polyester. It's hot. It is very hot. I wear hijab all day. It is very hot at times. So what I started to do as a Muslim woman is educate myself on what are fibers that are breathable um, and that are easy to manage and work with. So I started getting into cotton. Bamboo, I'm still arguing with. Well, very much still arguing with. Um, just because as great as it is, it is not the most sustainable because how it has to be processed. So me as a Muslim woman, I wanted to find a different way to be cool, which I think I'm pretty cool now, um, is how do I turn modest fashion into a way that's clean and fun? So as you see, my garments, they are really loose. They're one size fit most. I use zero waste pattern making where you give me a rectangle, I'm gonna produce something very beautiful based off that rectangle, not having paper waste, 
fabric waist down to my scraps, I turn them into crowns because I feel like as a Muslim woman, we need to own our crowns. And I have come in contact with other women that have had some challenges and hardships in their life where I love to say in my transitions, we give women their flowers. So every time you put something on from us, I'm handing you your flowers, whether it's a turban, a scarf, a headband, a naturally dyed kimono. So, and I also, I love that you mentioned like, whoa, how do we be cool? Over the last two years, I realized that I was losing this, this my mental health based off of sustainability. And I think that's one thing that we do not talk about is when we're preparing for this or trying to compete with fast fashion or the industry, we are also losing a sense of our mental sustainability here where we're trying to compete. So I also look at it in a way with, okay, how am I okay with just being a maker and creating slowly, um, which is very important. So you know what? I just had a photo shoot and I'm having the best time of my life because I finally owned who I was. And I thought that's what fashion meant. We are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be where we are supposed to be outspoken and we are not supposed to look like everybody else. Am I wrong? Is that, is that what fashion was? And I, and I don't agree like with, we all look the same now. Um, so those are ways that I like to highlight my form of modesty and modest transitions, where I love the fact that my gift as a designer, as a natural dyer is everything that I produce does not look the same. You could ask me, Melanie, can you please make that with Mary Gold's chamomile and eucalyptus? No matter how many times I dye it, that placement is never the same. So I love that because it's almost like I'm giving you exactly what you wanted and you don't look like anyone else. So that's how I tend to be cool. Great. I'm, we're getting all kinds of flashing, you know, hands in the air because I think we're at our time now. So no, 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 this is perfect. I think we could absolutely talk for two more hours. I think you guys all have such unique and beautiful um, and valuable perspectives to share. So maybe we can have a part two sometime and, and continue this conversation because I think this has been wonderful. I think that I'm passing the mic back to Guru for a minute to take us out here. Okay, and I'll move Thank out of the way. You. Thank you so much. I know that um, you, Kimberly, said that you have a hard stop. So I totally understand yeah. if you have to step out. But yeah, we're, we're good. thank you. All right. So thank you so much for, uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for moderating. This conversation was incredible. I had goosebumps all the time when you guys were talking. So thank you so much. Um, just a couple of words before we let everybody go and of course you know we want to announce the raffle winners um but firstly thank you so much for all you guys who joined in digitally um and everybody who's here in the room today um one quick word of shout out to rachel uh for managing the zoom stream and also uh for editing the video you saw in the beginning she took all the raw footage that iris and i put together and hours of raw footage just she put into five minutes, which was awesome. Uh, the Drexel folk here, thank you so much for lending us this space. Um, and, um, you know, having the students join us today. Steph Bender, if you're still online, thank you for the uh, flyers you put together for us. And Philly Ken, Sergio, hey. <laughs> thank you for uh, the stream. And um, yeah, I think I got everybody on here. And uh, let's look at the raffle winners. <laughs> so we have a small group here in person. And um, we have Shira David and Caroline Bird, <laughs> who won uh, the raffle in person. And then we have quite a few folks here that joined us online. So I'm going to call out a few names. And if you're on there, uh, say hello to Rachel and she let us know that you won and we can figure out how to get to the uh, gift cards digitally. Um, so the first name here is Lena Matos. Lena Matos. Where you at, Lena? <laughs> okay, Lena. Oh, nice. Woo, yay. Congratulations, Lena. Uh, the next one I have is Sarah Detwiller. I'm so bad, I mean, I don't know. I guess my pronunciation is okay. Sarah Detwiller. Or Detwiler? <laughs> okay. Okay. Emma Cashman. Emma from Udell. Are you on there? 
Okay, maybe not. So we have one so far from the digital list. Okay, Lillian Johnson. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, Matea Tomek. Also from Udell. Matea. Okay. Kiu Kiu Lao. That's a cute name. <laughs> Kiu Lao. No. Dang it. <laughs> They're losing out on something. I know. Y'all are losing Ow. out. Darlene Olson. <laughs> I'm gonna have to we'll have to say randomly pick from the ones who are yeah. still there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maggie Smith. Maggie Smith, are you there? It's crickets online. <laughs> okay. Margaret Dolbin. I'm going to go down the entire list. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're going to get in touch with uh, the winners of the, the raffle online. And uh, we'll pull them out and email you guys. So thank you once again. And um, yeah, yeah, we're closing the stream. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.